Before we get into the show, a quick reminder to check out and subscribe to the Beer Edge podcast with Andy Crouch. Each week, he's doing deep dives into breweries, talking with journalists covering the beer space, and unpacking a lot of what makes the beer industry so interesting. Find the Beer Edge podcast wherever you download shows. Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall, and Jeff Allworth is on the show this week. He's a writer, a thinker, a man who appreciates good beer and history, and he's the author of The Beer Bible. Its second edition was just released. I'll have more in a minute. But first, an invitation to check out BeerEdge.com for articles, to sign up for the newsletter, and more. And you should also head over to the This Week in Rauk Beer Facebook page and follow TW Rauk Beer on Twitter and Instagram for all kinds of smoked beer goodness. And we're able to bring you this show each week thanks to these advertisers. NZ Hops is a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. With a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations, the current day master growers proudly provide 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz or find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd to learn more. I met Jeff Allworth in the comments section of his blog, Beervana. It was a decade ago, and I had written an article for a newspaper, and Allworth had thoughts and took the piece to task. He was wrong, of course, so I, like any keyboard warrior, logged on and defended my digital honor. We became friends shortly after. If you're interested in beer, you likely know Allworth. He's internationally respected as a writer and authority on beer. He has a deep respect for beer styles, for beer history, tradition, and craftsmanship. The first edition of the Beer Bible has sold over 125,000 copies. And the second edition, according to Workman, the publisher, is, quote, the most comprehensive guide to the world of beer with everything you need to know about what to drink, where, when, and why. Jeff is also the author of the Beervana blog, The Widmer Way, The Secrets of Master Brewers, and Cider Made Simple, and he's also the co-host of the Beervana podcast. He hails from Portland, Oregon, and as he began a national book tour to support the new book, he spent a few days in New Jersey staying at my house. And you should check out the podcast he did while in this area with Steal This Beer and as well as Beer Massive. We recorded those during two book signings, just so you have additional context. With this go around, recorded in my backyard, neighbors, leaf blowers and all, I tried to cover new ground, but mostly just wound up having an enjoyable chat with an old friend. Here's our conversation. When you first showed up, uh, you were remarking that autumn is in the air, and I think that that was just an aroma thing, but now it's definitely uh, also an uh, audio thing. That's right. An auditory thing as well. Yeah, you can Um, smell the leaves and you can hear the leaf blower. The nice thing is, like, you know, now you're getting like a little bit of that diesel gas coming yeah, through from absolutely. the uh, from the weed whacker <laughs> and everything else like that. Um, as we've been going around for the last couple of days, I've been trying to pick up on how you approach beer, and I know how I walk into a pub. I know you know sort of what I look for, and oftentimes it's a little bit of a frenetic energy where. Uh, if I'm there for work, like I'm trying to do whatever. Um, and like, I'm not necessarily focused on the experience at first as much as I am just trying to get settled. And what I've noticed, you talk about romance with beer a lot. <laughs> <laughs> how do you find the romance in beer? Or, or how do you experience romance in beer? It's interesting listening to you make, you know, describe what your experience is when you're on the job and you walk into a pub and, yeah. and how you, how you. I've been observing you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, cause I, I don't, I haven't had a chance to apply my journalistic skills to my own uh, behavior, but I think what happens is I walk in and I, I either feel the romance or I don't right away. I feel the, uh, pubby feng shui or brewery feng shui right away. Um, and it, and it usually stops me and pulls me out of the job, and that's the vibe I, I try to 
uh, get into, which is really, I think, where the drinker lives. Um, and for the most part, it's where the brewers live themselves. You know, everybody gets into this business not to get rich, but because, um, you know, we create these spaces where people get together and drink beer and have fun. And uh, these guys work crazy long hours with doused in caustic uh, exactly for that experience. And, you know, I was a, I was a beer drinker and a a bar fly long before I started writing about beer. And so I still, I think those are deeper roots. And that's when I walk, you know, all the stress leaves the second I step through the door. I find that I, I, I love hearing that. And I, I find it very hard to relate to that because when I look around the bar, you know, and if I'm there and I'm having conversations like, and it's, you're being bounced around in, you know, a hundred different, different directions, you know, it's, I'm easily distracted by loud sounds or, you know, smells or like whatever else. And so if I'm at a brewery and, you know, they're transferring something and a motor goes off all of a sudden, I'm, I'm looking away and I've lost <laughs> my train of thought. But for the pub experience with the whole romance thing, I, I with untapped, with socialization, with televisions and bars, with different playlists playing overhead we're being assaulted by so much else outside of the glass of beer that it can be tough to sort of immediately home in on the romance or try to you know get that feng shui as you're talking about are you able to just sort of clear that clutter i guess so i mean i i do recognize that you know there are different experiences you can have in drinking places and some are outside my comfort zone there you know if it's a very new tap room with a lot of sunshine and a lot of edison, brightness edison bulbs and aluminum stools yeah, yeah uh that's a little bit harder for me to work with uh and, and often i feel like those are a little bit more soulless they don't they weren't they don't they don't seem to be uh, they don't may may not function on the human scale that i function on and so i don't you know necessarily always fall into that but um but for the most part i can tune a lot of that out uh you know it's, it's just part of the background noise every bar you've ever been in is going to have music on the back on the on the playlist and it is actually one of those things when it's a good playlist playing the kind of music that i like it, en it enhances it and if it's you know 70s butt rock i just tune it out uh <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know for, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I probably, because I'm not a reporter, I think we may approach this, we think we think about these things yeah. differently. And I, I'm not actually, I don't go into reporting mode, I go into kind of like absorption mode. All right, so walk me through that then. How do you, what's that process like for you? There are 9,000 breweries in the United States. There's 19,000 the rest of the world, I don't know. There's, yeah. like, there's a lot of breweries. There's a lot there. of breweries, there's a lot of beer. And... As a writer, if I'm going to talk about anything in beer, certainly breweries, any pub, I need to find something that's going to be interesting to the reader that describes why this pub is different or interesting. And they won't always be. You know, a brewery uh, may, may just not be interesting and there's nothing there to find. But when I walk in, I'm always looking for what it is that makes it distinctive and that's going to be the thing that I write about. And I'll build the story around whatever, you know, uh, for example, when I went to Schneider's or, uh, in, in Germany, uh, it, it's a brewer that only makes wheat beer. And it, and I was, I knew that, I expected that. And Hans-Peter Drexler, who took me around, is a wonderful gentleman brewer. He's retired now. I kind of hurts my heart. But, um, but I still didn't have the hook until uh, until we got to the fermentation room, and there were, like there usually are in a brewery, uh, some conditioning tanks there. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, we had to install these because we started making non-alcoholic beer. But before we did that, we never had conditioning tanks because it went straight from fermentation to the bottle. We didn't. That's how you make vice beer. And <laughs> and and then somehow it just clicked in that this is a different kind of brewery. Making vice beer is a different way of thinking about beer and making beer. And, um, and it's very not, you know, it's in, in some ways not at all German. And so then that was the hook. And then all of a sudden, all the other bits of data that I had started to fall into place around that fact. Um, and so when I think about that brewery, I think about the fact that 
you know, for a hundred and whatever years, they, they, they only, uh, they had no conditioning tanks, which was amazing. We were talking about this as we were driving around. So you've been in town for a couple of days. Uh, we've gone to a couple of breweries and we were talking about how you can walk in and there's a little bit of chaos to a tap list. You mm-hmm. know, it's, there's some places that try to be a little bit of something for everything. But when you're talking about Schneider, and it got me thinking of like Schlenkele or or Val or a lot of these other European breweries that do one thing well. And there's not many examples in the U.S. of places that are solely focused on one thing or one style. You know, I'd obviously think of right. like Trumer or Bierstadt or... You know, there's there's a, a a few other handfuls that I imagine you know some of the the wild producers, I guess. But like by and large, I guess we're more gluttonous, or I, I don't know quite what the word is, or scattershot, or something. But is there something to be said for doing one thing well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Is there a market for that in the United States? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think so. Um, I got to go to the most recent trip to Europe I took uh, when I got to visit Harvey's in Lewis mm-hmm. and Miles Jenner gave me the tour. Miles Jenner is, um, he, he, he was born on the brewery grounds. This is a brewery that ha- has a, a, a little residence for the brewer yeah. and his father was the brewer. I toured with Adrian Tierney Jones a couple years ago. Yeah. yeah. And so he has been at that brewery drinking Sussex bitter since I think the 1950s. Um, of course he was a kid then, you know, tasting the, the beer his dad was brewing. Yeah. And then he's been brewing this beer for 40 years or something. Um, when we started the tour, he, he pointed to the hillside above the uh, brewery and he talked about the way the water, the, the rainwater filters through that hill in, in, down into the borehole under the brewery. And he, he understood the beer at a level, uh, you know, the water, the, the way the water behaved, and then actually I asked him more about that, and he talked about a flood they once had and how that changed the water. And he he has made this same beer over and over and over again so much that it's in his bones. You know, he can he can look at the wort stream coming out of the uh, the hop back and have a sense of that beer at a level that is you know really deep and personal. It's like part of his arm, and it is very different than if you know how to make. A particular style of beer, mm-hmm. like an IPA, and you're trying a new one, uh, because there there are literally hundreds of choices you can make in the brew house and the you know the cold room to affect the way the beer is going to behave and taste and and all of that stuff. And they can be minor tweaks. And until you've made it, you know, a few hundred times, a few thousand times, those interactions are always a little bit mysterious to you. And you may get a great beer, but you may not know the beer the way that Miles Jenner knows his beer. So I think just to say, yes, uh, there is something. These these old brewers talking, you, you find a brewer who's been making a sim, you know, a range of the same beers or the same beer uh, for decades. You learn something different than you talk to a new brewer who's thinking about the opposite side, the innovation side. How can I change this? What can I do that's new and fun? Uh, so... But there's also consumer pressure on that as well. Yeah. Where somebody walks into the local brewery like here and it's like, oh, I had your Citra Mosaic last week. You know, where's your El Dorado Idaho 7? Like, yeah. So to bring that back to the United States. Okay. uh, I do think that we're not so far away from a time in which uh, IPAs are so ubiquitous. They're, they're the, they're the, our national tradition and they're going to be as sort of fixed in our beer culture as uh hellas uh is in 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 munich or um or that bitter is in in england and brewers in the united states we have a different kind of culture so part of our culture is uh integration uh, you know we we we're always changing and integrating but it's, it's an inexorable force that people like familiar stuff. And we saw this with COVID. People went back to flagships. You yeah. know, they, didn't, they didn't actually abandon them. They, just, they were just distracted for a while and drank other stuff. They still love those flagships. And if you look at uh, a number of the, the American breweries who've been making IPAs for a while, some of them have evolved. So you know, that's part of that process uh, that, that can happen over decades. Um, 
you know, you got a, a, a dogfish 60 minute. Uh, you, you have a Pliny the Elder. I talked to Vinny Salerzo about how that beer's evolved a little bit. So they change, but that, that change comes from knowledge too. The brewer is, you know, making intentional choices based on a deeper understanding of those hundreds of variables. Yeah. And a beer, it's hard for me to imagine that a beer like Pliny the Elder is ever not going to be made. And you look at Russian River, that's really the, the you know, they're going to make 100 beers a year, you know, including pub beers. Yeah. But the thing that they're really known for and the thing they really care about and the thing that, you know, is, is sort of central to that whole enterprise is Pliny the Elder. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's slowly becoming one of the grand old beers of the world. And, and it almost can't change now because so many people have such a deep connection to it. Yeah. But is there, so what I, I want to talk about, like sort of the tracking of the evolution of styles, because you do that in the book and, you know, you're, you're sort of, you know, talking about flavor profiles and styles themselves, which are harder and harder to categorize these days. Because, you know, even just when you say American IPA, you can walk into some breweries and you're getting West Coast and clear and grapefruit and bitter and really gorgeous looking. And you say American IPA and some other breweries and you get a glass of orange juice. Like it's, it's, right. it's very different um, uh, when, when, it, when it comes to that. But a lot of the European beers, or let me ask, for a lot of these beers that have been around for so long, you know, like the Schneiders and all of that, are they as popular as they've ever been or have they just sort of settled into they have a dedicated fan base that keeps them going because there is this sort of human trend of like new and shiny and you know we can appreciate classics but we're not always rushing out for classics that kind of thing like is it yeah no things definitely change so uh lager country seems to have kind of the the best continuity in, in terms of styles uh the czech republic bohemia and and bavaria uh beer styles there have have changed a little bit but you know you got to go all the way back to the 19th century to find a time in in uh in, in bavaria where they didn't have a pale lager yeah uh, and you know so it's, it's slower there but and if you look at to take uh go back to harvey's before sussex bitter was their flagship they had a mild which they still make but there was a time when Miles were much more popular. So about the time Miles was a little kid, uh, his his father was making a whole lot more Mild than they make now. Right. And so that shifts, and there's no way to stop that process. You know, culture does change, and, and beer styles change with it. But they still make that Mild, right? And in 20 years or 50 years or 80 years, uh, as if Russian River is still there, they're going to be making Pliny as well. And you know what else they make? I don't know. They might be making other stuff too. But these these styles, uh, they persist longer. You know, long more than capitalism would suggest they would. They have a little stickiness to them. And so, yeah. I mean, you're 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 absolutely right that there's a churn. Yeah. There's there's always going to be a churn, and it's out of that churn that we get more interesting future styles and a lot of stuff that are blind alleys that we never pursue again, brewed yeah. IPA. Uh, well, yeah, and that's the thing, right? I mean, so when the first edition came out, you were focusing on a lot of styles. When the second edition came out, a lot of those styles uh, that are now featured in the book didn't even really exist. And brewed IPA is one of those ones that existed in between editions but is no longer you know, relevant, that kind of thing. Like... Were you surprised at how quickly things changed style-wise from the first edition to the second edition? Yeah, I was. I, and and I, I think everybody who follows beer was because, you know, we haven't seen that kind of change in forever. It's been, you know, yeah. I mean, I, you have to go back. I don't know where and, wh you know, when to find a kind of explosion of, of new beers being made on the planet. It's really an unusual time. Yeah. So that's definitely true. But you can also think about IPA less as a style. You know, I think there's the B, uh, the GABFification or the BAFification of, of styles where... Brewers Association, yeah. Yeah, so now we have, uh, you know, we have created the category of brute IPA. It's now a style. We're putting it in there. We're going to judge on it. Well, that's one way to think about it. But another way to think about it is that American IPA is this national tradition in which 
and and I think customers actually get this a lot more than uh, the you know the people who judge beer competitions and some of the people who watch it. American IPA is a beer, and it doesn't matter if it's black or white uh, or red or Belgian or strong or weak. American or IP- international. Yeah. yeah, American IPA is a style of beer in which the flavors of New World hops uh, are bright and expressive and very aromatic. And as long as that quality is present, then we kind of know what we're talking about. So, you know, Brute IPA can come along as an expression of this, but it's sort of like the lump on the alligator's back. The alligator hasn't changed. It's just, you know, we have we have a lot of different lumps. But basically, American IPA is a known thing now, and I don't see it changing fundamentally from this this kind of, you know, we're, we're going to, we'll, we'll there will there'll be a conversation about how much bitterness should be present and how much cloudiness should be pl- present. But uh, the juiciness, the aromatics, that's not up for debate anymore. Those are settled matters. When you do get one of the, I like that analogy of the, the bumps on the alligator's back. When you do get one of these new bumps, though, ha- have you been able to, <clears throat> in your research, in your conversations, figure out why sometimes one of these new bumps becomes more permanent and sometimes they don't? No, that's the witchy quality of culture. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> I, I always use the example of uh, Cologne and Dusseldorf. In Cologne, they drink Kolsch, and in Dusseldorf, they drink alt beer. And if you, if you try to figure out why it's one style in one place and one style in the other and why they refuse to drink each other's beer uh, and why they don't drink anything else... There's no answer. It's just a weird, you know, humans are weird. They behave differently. And, um, you know, they drink, they drink Cascale in, in, in the UK and they drink uh, strong triples like you like in uh, Belgium. And uh, they drink hoppy IPAs here. So within that, I think this is one reason why, um, you know, people on the West Coast were caught, caught by surprise by these uh, hazy IPAs from New England that were much fuller and sweeter uh, and less bitter than we like out here. I shouldn't say out here because I'm in New Jersey, but out where I live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think that's, you know, that's always up for grabs. And, and it it's just going to express some kind of weird thing I don't understand in, in human nature. Um, and where we exactly land on that, where where Americans find their sweet spot, I think is, I, I, I would challenge anyone. I mean, I, you could guess and you might be right, but it's like throwing a dart at the board. Going back to this romantic theme, because you, you just blindly throw out or you just casually throw out, you know, well, they're drinking Cascale in the UK. And while, yes, that's true, not nearly as much as they used to. And it's harder yeah. and harder to find. And the examples that you find are not, I think, what even older generations think of taste-wise, flavor-wise. There's been, you know, there's debate and ca- I'm not going to get into camera and all that. But, like, we had two different casks over the last couple of days, which is kind of remarkable because they were both a lot of fun in their own way and yeah. kind of a throwback and kind of romantic to it. But it remains a harder sell to newer generations. It remains, you know, and it's a lot of work to, to take care of them properly. Um, but I was watching you sort of, again, get lost in some of these glasses uh, when they were when they were put down in front of you. First a carton with the, the with the brown ale, and then uh, Mui, the pub ale, the the mild at uh, at Bond Place. Um, romantic wise, what do you love about Cascale? Well, Cascale is such a wonderful act of craft you know we always talk about craft and it was so bizarre to me the first time i went to the uk and the craft brewers were were really at their kind of most potent moment of cultural relevance and we and when we talked about uh craft breweries you know it was always american style guys in in 10 heck uh kits that were you know making beer exactly like americans and I thought, this does not seem like a craft to me. What seems like a craft is this Victorian brewery over here where they, you know, use uh, artisanal <laughs> malted grains, uh, local hops, uh, and, um, you know, demand that they, when they, when they cask this up and let it, re, you know, ferment, finishing out in the, in the, in the 
the cask that the publican takes good care of it so that the the craft continues all the way you know through the person who's pulling that pint it's it's insane there are so many places that this beer can go sideways and 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 it does which yeah. is one reason why it's not not that popular it's not consistent um because of all the ways it can go sideways so it was so surprising to me that it was not it's like that's not craft beer and i i in my from my perspective it's the most crafted style of all you know there's there's it's just very human it's the most perhaps the most human style there's so many hands involved in it um so i love all of that but i also love the flavor profile and that's you know i mean i think leaving aside um uh, the the history and the romance uh and the culture of all these these beers which are a big part of why i enjoy them i also appreciate the way they present aesthetically i've I feel like one of my talents as a writer uh, is just to be immediately being able to tell if a beer is good or not. And um, part of and that's just, you know, it comes from uh, a sense of those aesthetics. And a really good cask ale is just a really good beer. It's hard to beat a really good cask ale. Okay, but you're a writer now, so use your descriptive words to what, what constitutes a really good cask ale then, aesthetically. Well, yeah, I mean, so th- in terms of how many hops should be in there and what strength it should be, that's a little bit up for grabs. But but fundamentally, what you want is these this balance point of these different elements, these wonderful uh, base malts that the English use, which are made from barley varieties, which each brewer knows and will tell you what barley variety they use. Uh, that's unheard of, uh, maybe until the last two or three years in the United States. Those malts will really create the base of the uh, the drinkability of that pint. Um, they give it a fullness and a kind of luxury, a silkiness. So that's one element. Uh, you have those amazing English uh, yeasts, which we're now borrowing for hazy IPAs like we discovered them ourselves. But the reason we use them is because they're so full of esters. Uh, they're usually distinctive, so you get a different ester profile from every strain. So that becomes a big part of it. Water is often a big factor, so you might have a stiffness. Uh, you know, I was always surprised at how uh, London Pride has a flavor of, of the water treatments that is different than a standard Burtonizing. Uh, just tastes a little bit different, so that's there. And, of course, you have the, the hops, which shouldn't overwhelm any of that other stuff. You know, Americans make hoppy beers designed to blast everything else away. And in with... Uh, w- English brewers just think in terms of harmonics. They're trying to get all of those things balanced just right. So if you add a little bit more uh, juiciness to it, you're going to have to tweak a few other things. And uh, But that's something that, you know, it, it shouldn't change the fundamental prescription. And then all, you put all of that on a cask so it's a little bit lower uh, carbonation. And everybody slags it for being warm, which is weird to me because the warmer a beer is, you know, to a certain point, you don't want to be warm, warm, right. uh, but you, it, it will allow the, the flavors and aromas to unfold. So all of these things make a pint of beer that is just exquisite to drink. And, and it's, and it's the kind of beer that wears really well. It tastes good on the first sip and it tastes good on the fifth pint, you know, the first sip of the fifth pint. And, and I agree with that. You hit on the one word, though, right? Because it, for the for the consumers, and when I've had really wonderful Cascal, it's been a remarkable experience. And there's been some brewers uh, here in the U.S. who have tried really hard to promote a Cascal program. Like, I know you're going to Baltimore soon uh, for Guinness, but, like, right down the road, Heavy Seas. I mean, Hugh Sisson was trying to push Cascal in America for, for years and then just finally had to give up because... The proper explanation that you just made takes five minutes to get across to the average drinker, and then it's the tasting and going from there. Whereas American beer advertising for the last 70 years has been cold and refreshing. Right. You know, and by comparison, it's just been, well, that's just warm and flat. And, it, and it's worked so well that cold IPA is now a thing even, you know, because that really, you're right, it really is a, I think as, as a marketing thing, you talk to Kevin Davey and um, I think he's from way, Wayfinder out by you. Yeah, yeah he's way more uh, clinical and, and pragmatic about why cold IPA works as a style and also as a name. But you're right. Yeah, it's baked well, in I the mean, cake. And Guinness extra cold was a thing for a while, right? Absolutely. Or maybe it still is. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. yeah. No, it's 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 true. I mean, not every style is going to be popular in the United States. It, it uh, cask ale falls way outside of our, uh, you know, our sweet spot. And I, you know, I I don't know. I 
not every beer style will be successful in the United States. What I hope is that uh, I think I think Camera was such a, a wonderful organization to preserve Cascale at a moment when and when it might have been wiped off the earth, and yeah. and then they be they became this horrible retardant for it for uh, flourishing in a time when people were coming back to full flavored ales. Um, the fact that they don't allow uh, cask systems where you put a you know you fill you refill the cask with uh, CO two um, is is just crazy. And in the United States, one of the ways people are trying to bring cask back is by making sure that they don't have those same problems and they do use CO two. They do take a little bit more care, making sure that their beers don't go sour because that's terrible. And you know it's it. It's the kind of thing that really undermines the whole the whole endeavor, and you know, you and I have had bad pints in yes. in, in, in England a lot. And uh, if they would just slightly tweak that a little bit, not be so hidebound, I think I think people w- would encounter many many more good pints, and then all of a sudden it might change a little bit. As writers and reporters and folks who have pretty much extraordinary access to brewers and locations and getting into going into things that. Um, you know, we get to go beyond the tap room a lot of the time because we're going to report on it and, 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 and talk about it. And I don't know how many breweries you've visited um, uh, in your life. Do you know? I don't. And I, I kind of distinguish between tours and just visits. Sure. Uh, so um, the visits, you know, okay, crazy amount. Yeah. And tours, uh, quite a bit fewer, but, yeah. but still a lot. But there are days when you put the notebook away when you walk out of the brewery, when you're on your way back to the hotel or home or something like that, that you realize that it was a near perfect day, that the stars just kind of aligned. Um, and I think about the day that we were at Cascade together, mm-hmm. you know, six years ago, um, and you know, just walking through the fooder forest, and you know, Ron was opening up beers for us, and like we were just, you know, I, it was yeah. just, you know, by the end of the day, as I was falling asleep that night, I was like, this was. This was really special. This 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 was a lot of fun, and I wrote a lot of stories about that, and you know, got a lot got a lot out of it. Um, it wasn't just like a singular experience. Um, is there something that sticks out in your mind as just sort of a perfect day that you keep coming back to? Well, I have to say, uh, as uh, the biggest. And I think only beer people are going to appreciate this. Uh, other people don't appreciate it, for sure. Uh, that's pretty much all who listens to this yeah, podcast. Yeah, though, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're not really big in the knitting circle or anything, yeah. <laughs> um, I, it, it, in being uh, chosen to write the Beer Bible by Workman, uh, it opened up this opportunity for me to draw up a list of my of the, the most respected breweries, the breweries I wanted to most visit in the world, and uh, uh, send emails to them and, and have them invite me to come to their breweries and then in nearly every case and i'm only saying nearly because i can't think of any exceptions it was the master brewer at each brewery uh, who took me around and we would spend two three sometimes many more hours together and they the thing about brewers is they don't get people who understand brewing at a deep level very often either and so uh, they get excited to show you weird stuff because you're starting to get you know excited. Uh, they take you to things that are off off the normal tour because you actually care about it and yeah. they hunger for that. And so I would say, uh, you know, I, I reflect on the the opportunity I had to tour. You know, if I just start ticking off the names of the the places I went uh, and and the brewers I spoke to, it it's like. It's millions of dollars of experience points. You know, people would pay so much money to have had just one or two of those, and I just got them day after day on my tours, yeah. and, it, and it was it was extraordinary. So that's that's just off the top. That's without even coming back to the United States, and you know, the experience that we had with Ron Gansberg, the full the full we got the full Gansberg. That yeah, was not awesome really day. did. <laughs> he opened the door to the brewery, and you turned to me and you go, "Oh, this is going to be good," because <laughs> we just thought we were stopping in just to like say hi, and you know, we didn't know he was going to be there, and he was getting yeah. ready to retire, and I just remember that he had this like, like the the brewery staff that was there at the time just started like collecting as we walked through more and more. And so by the time it ended, there was, I don't know, eight or nine of us all together standing around the bottling line. And he was using the opportunity to sort of instill upon them 
the, you know, the solemnity of the job, the importance of the job, the importance of the liquid, like the, you know, time and patience. And I mean, he was opening up, you know, 15 year old bottles at that point. And, you know, things start to get a little fuzzy after that, but, right. it, like, <laughs> but, but still, but it, there, there's, there's real romance and, and time and cherish. He, you could tell that he just cared about what he was doing. And that was just so much fun. And again, yeah. that's not going to happen for the average person. That's, that's right. And yeah. it, it kind of hurts my heart. I, in the beer Bible, I do try to send people to breweries because I think even public tours uh, are often a lot better than we think. And I've, sure. I've done a number of those as well when I, it's not possible to meet with the brewer. Um, and and I think you can ask questions, but you're right. At the end of the day, um, unless you know the brewer personally, it's probably n- not available to everyone. And I, I kind of wish it was. And I know there have been people who have tried to create tours that do that. But it, it yeah, it's just it's a little bit hard to recreate them. Uh, it's an organic experience. All right, then I'm going to rephrase my question and sort of take it out of that of tour aside. Was there or is there a place where you've had just nice days as a beer drinker where you can have the focus on the romantic pint um, where you don't necessarily have to have the notebook out and that you're just trying to... Uh, Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, We had one uh, in Bethlehem on... uh, uh, whatever day that was, Monday, Monday, uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Yeah, you know that was that was one of those experiences. We kind of had had that same feeling with um, uh, uh, when we were at, at Bond Place. We yeah. walked in and it's this lively pub. It instantly feels like home. Um, uh, Sam and Gina, the co-owners, she's pulling pints. He's he's kind of fluttering around. Later on, uh, the the brewer comes out. We, ha- you know, we sit at a table. The brewer's chatting, and and, and this that's is, something that can happen for anybody. Exactly, I was going to say, and this is a small place, so I'm sure everybody else has already had these experiences because yeah. the locals they know all of these these folks, uh, and you know we're sharing beer and we're talking about beer. They had a fresh hot beer on. Sam and I talked a long time about fresh hot beers. I'm trying to uh, coax him out to uh, uh, Oregon in, uh, in September so I can make him drink a bunch of fresh hot beers and th- that's how those kinds of things happen and that experience so that experience happened with the with the owner and the brewer but that can happen if you're a drinker with you know your friends and any any kind with other locals there that's what beer drinking is about that's why people like sam and gina create a space like that because they want people to come and have those kinds of experiences together and it doesn't have to be with the brewer it happens to be with the brewer because that's that's what we're doing you mm-hmm. know with our lives but those containers create those experiences every night for people you know uh some 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 pubs have uh a television above the bar so you can watch like last night uh the yankees and the red Sox. you know very big you can have this very big this, this is moment. gonna air weeks from now and nobody's gonna remember that the Sox knocked the the yankees out of the wild card those socks stop stop <laughs> um breaking my heart um i fight you into my home have you on the podcast and you're just, you're just, yeah. What else would you expect from a Red Sox? I fan? love that you always would wear a, a Red Sox hat. Like that's sort of been your trademark. I didn't uh, bring it here. Tutorial but, style, and yeah. and now you're wearing a Pine of the Elder. Just, you know, you were either going to make people mad or jealous with your with your choice <laughs> of uh, headwear. And um, periodically, uh, someone will, who's not a beer person will see this hat and say, "Why are you wearing a Pliny the Elder hat? <laughs> what? Wasn't he an ancient Greek or something?" And I'm reminded, oh, that's right. Many people have no idea what have this no, means. Yeah, yeah. If you're not outside of California or Monk's Cafe, it's not really going to come up all that much. Yeah. Last summer on the show, um, I had Zach Beckworth from Ben Brewing Company on your recommendation. Yeah. Because I was trying to get to a little bit more of the heart of the matter of Fresh Hop. Yeah. And because you were trying to convince me that I've never had a good Fresh Hop beer experience. Um, which isn't totally true because I did harvest a couple years ago. I went to harvest a couple years ago, but Excellent. but I wasn't there three weeks after harvest, which is when the real thing starts to happen. You are like a tour ambassador now, or a tourism ambassador for people coming to the Pacific Northwest. Not necessarily for hop harvest, but after hop harvest to go drink good fresh hop beers. You have an audience make the case. Yeah, fresh hop beers are the coolest thing that happens on the beer calendar 
in 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 the world, and mostly it happens in the Pacific Northwest. Also happens in the UK, and, and it's starting to happen elsewhere. But it's this it's this this moment when, uh, and I'm going to talk from the consumer ex- pers- uh, experience here because I think we've all heard of what brewers do. You know, they go grab the hops straight out of the field before they've been dried and put them in the beer. Um, and that's that's the romance, and it's kind of how when when we started doing fresh hops in the Pacific Northwest, everybody got it really caught up to begin with with that story, and it seemed very unusual and cool, and and uh, you know full of of localness and terroir and the locavore thing, and all seemed to fit together well. But from the drinker's perspective, the way it it actually plays out is uh, probably a hundred breweries and. In, in each state will make fresh hop beers every year and many will make multiple fresh hop beers. So there are just, you know, at any given time, there are, are dozens pouring in uh, cities in the Pacific Northwest. And the thing about fresh hop beers is no matter how well they're made, that the quality that makes them really pop is incredibly impermanent. It, it lasts, maybe you have, you have it at its optimum uh, peak maybe two hour, uh, two weeks, two hours would be really bad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what you have to do, this is the, and this is actually the fun thing, is you have to go around to pub and you know pub after pub and just drink a bunch of them, and some are a little bit, a little bit too green, and they they're they're a little bit chewy, and uh, it's like I, somebody put leaves in my beer, and then some are fading, and you can tell they were fresh hot, but they're just they're tailing off, and then some are just right in the middle and and when you get one of those pints and and you get to taste the flavors the unique uh, flavors that can't be recreated in any other way that's that and uh, in a beer that's been extremely well made there's a kind of sublime delight it's it's uh it's a, it's a it's a thing you have to do on site it's a thing you have to do at a particular time of the year um and that's what makes it so fun we don't really have very many opportunities for a kind of seasonality at, at that level and, and so it's it's so cool and people in the pacific northwest revere this season uh it's just a giant thing for the for the locals and because it happens after the kids are back in school uh we don't really get a lot of tourists to come out and experience it, but it 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 really if you were planning a trip to the Pacific Northwest, that's and you like hops, yeah. which if you're an American listening to this, you probably like probably hops. Probably like yeah. hops, yeah. So you sh- that's the that's absolutely the time you should come. And it's one of those to take it back to the 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 discussion a, a few minutes ago where we were talking about those amazing experiences that you can have in a pub. Yeah. You can have some amazing experiences with with these. And and part of it is just you drink a lot of them. You know, it's it's a it's a game of numbers, and that becomes its own sense of joy too. How has seasonality changed style wise? Like I, I I've been thinking like you know we're in October fest season now or fest beer season or Martin season like it's in you know pumpkin beer season and then that you know used to go into you know the the you know, the winter ales or the beer de Noels or you know what whatever and then spring was always. A little bit more difficult. There weren't a ton of spring spring type beers. Um, you know, I mean, you get you get some box and some things like that. But like spring was always sort of tough to nail down. And then summer ale as a generic catch-all term, which used to just mean like fruited or lightly spiced or or whatever. But now people are fruiting and spicing beers all year round. Right. So it's sort of less. Have have is there are there. I don't even know. I, I'm trying to figure out, like, where do things stand seasonality? You know, because you can have a pumpkin beer year-round now, which makes it a little less special. And I'm sure there's going to be some brewers that are going to be making, you know, Martins year-round, um, just because there is a little bit of demand for it, which makes it a little less special. Wet hop, fresh hop, you can't do, but... Right. I don't know. I, I'd be curious about your your answer to this, too, because uh, uh, COVID has been weird. Yeah. It seems like it, COVID has made us all a little bit more traditional in our approaches. And I, I, I certainly, I think it's because we've been trapped for 19 months in this stasis. And so watching the seasons roll around is one of the only things that we can uh, do that, that gives us some different experience. And it does actually seem like, especially this year, the seasonality of the beers is, uh, people are focusing a little bit more on that, which is which I know, is fun. I noticed that as well. Yeah. yeah. So maybe maybe COVID like we're having actually. conversations about Fest beer Martin and Oktoberfest, which 
has not happened previously. Yeah, yeah. Every place we've gone, there's been some version of that beer on tap, and yeah. a lot of them have pumpkin ales. We have, I think, we've lost the pumpkin ale tradition in the Northwest. I don't, I haven't seen a pumpkin ale in a long time. <sighs> you can't swing a <laughs> dead cat around here without without hitting them. Although it's been lessened in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. you know, I, as I think, the, you know. Lagers came back into fashion on the craft level. Pumpkins sort of, you know, dropped off. I mean, when you were walking through the grocery store and everything was pumpkin spiced flavor, you hit overload at some point and people just kind of yeah. pull back a little bit unless you're like a super fan. And if you are, great. But I think beer wise, people were just kind of being like, all right. And the other part of it, too, is with pumpkin spice, when year round now with pastry stouts and pastry sours and pastry wines and everything else like that, where you're getting vanilla or cinnamon or anything else all year round in other right. beers, you know, pumpkin beers don't taste like pumpkin beers. They taste like the spice. Yeah. So <laughs> it's less special, I think, than it used to be. Yeah, I bet you're right about that. Um, it just occurred to me as I was talking to you about that. But yeah. Yeah, I think you're I'd right about that. have to go that. back and, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, we'll have to watch that. I think it's, it's one of those, uh, uh, the listeners can, can help observe too. Uh, you know, are, are we going to watch as we get out of October into November, December, are we getting winter ales? Are we getting a lot more porters and stouts? Are we getting, you know, wintry stuff or is it just because two or three years ago there was a seasonality, but it was just different IPAs. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we got our winter IPA. Now we have our, our spring IPA and our summer IPA. Uh, so I, I don't know, I guess we can watch and see. I, I, it's hard to predict how that'll go. I, I would like it. I, I certainly drink seasonally. I drink different beers at the different times of the year. I, I, I suspect you do too. Yeah. April and I have been watching the good place again, uh, uh during the, during the pandemic just for a little bit of levity and a little bit of light. and It's, uh, it's good for the heart. It is. So you've seen the show. Yeah. So you know about the green door. Yeah. And you can walk through the green door and be anywhere, any place, any time. If such uh, magic existed uh, on this plane of existence and there's a green door that you could walk through right now and be anywhere with anybody, where would you go? Who would you be with? Well, I'm with John Hall. So, Stop. so I would, I would, I would, I would take you uh, okay. <laughs> into uh, into Bomberg, into the Schlenkerle Pub, which the answer probably would have been Schlenkerle anyway, but okay. especially because I'm looking at you and you're pandering to the audience. Uh, well, yeah. I'm slightly pandering to the audience, but I got to tell you, <laughs> it is a 600 year old pub in medieval Bomberg that looks out over uh, buildings that have also been there six hundred plus years on cobblestone streets, half timbered, uh, kind of rustic, Bavaria, uh, Franconian architecture. The only way you can tell you you're, it's the 21st century is because people are wandering by with, you know, backpacks and Nikes. Right. Uh, other than that, that pub is one of the most atmospheric, extraordinary places on the planet to be. And if it were my local, I, I don't, I mean, I think it would destroy me as a beer writer. I just wouldn't go anywhere else. <laughs> There is a market for solely focusing on Rauch beer. I can tell you that. <laughs> I can tell you that with firsthand experiences. Um, it's one place that I still haven't been, so I'm, yeah. you know, I'm hopeful to to make it there at some point. But, well, let uh, me let me uh, add that as an incentive. It's amazing. I will. Um, I'm going to remind everybody that the beer Bible is out wherever books are sold, and if you have the first edition, that's great. But the second edition, uh, you built upon it in a really remarkable way and I think they complement each other pretty yeah, well. Yeah, if you're so. if you're a completist there's is actually an argument to be made to have them both cuz I did have to <laughs> cut a bunch of stuff out of the first edition. So if you have that uh, and you want to know more about Mildale, yeah. I'm certain you do. Yes. Uh, then Wild about Miles. That's right. Then you're going to find it in the first you're going to find a lot more information in the first edition and there's other, you know, other stuff too. So um, they I did I mean, if people are going to pay $25 for a new edition, it better have some new material. Yes. So, um, so that yeah. means that I got to cut stuff out of the mm -hmm. other one. So I could have just added to it. It could have been, you know, a thousand pages, but at a certain point, you start to lose people, I think. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Bookshelves from Ikea can only <laughs> hold so much uh, pounds per, per shelf. Um, all right. Well, we're going to get back out into the world. So thanks for. Thanks for doing this. Thanks thank for you for down. having me uh, on this podcast, and I want to I want to thank you especially for your hospitality I'm here. Very kind. I I, uh, I will write about a little bit of that, so I will not um, <laughs> I will not mention it here. Uh, look 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 for that. John has been a spectacular host. We're um, we're friends. I don't know yeah. if anyone knows that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's, it's been the, the the tour is starting out in gentle 
hands and the kind hospitality of April Darcy and John Hall. So You're I've, very I've been, kind. I've been very happy to be here. Well, thanks. My thanks to Jeff for spending some time in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and I can't encourage you enough to get a second edition copy of the Beer Bible. Jeff's dedication to the education of the world's most fascinating beverage is inspiring, and you can find the books wherever books are sold. What are you reading these days? What's in your glass? You can always email me. It's John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L at BeerEdge.com, or you can talk with me on Twitter at John underscore Hall. Beer Edge is also on social media at The Beer Edge. And if you love smoked beers, and of course you do, a reminder to check out the This Week in Rauk Beer group on Facebook or on Twitter and Instagram at TW Rauk Beer. And if you're interested in advertising, you can reach out to Liz Melby. She's at Liz at BeerEdge.com, and she'll let you know all of the information. And speaking of that, this episode was made possible by the support of NZ Hops, a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. With a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations, the current day master growers proudly provide 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz, or you can find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd to learn more. One last reminder to go check out beeredge.com to see all that we have going on. Also to check out the Beer Edge podcast. Steal This Beer has new episodes every Monday, and the BYO Nano podcast drops on the 15th of every month. And as for this show, well, Nate Schweber, he does the music, Jeff Quinn designed the logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday. And that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer.